to making remote hearings accessible, fair and humane under COVID-19. The first in a series of webinars brought to you by the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory and the Judicial College. My name is Lisa Harker and I'm the director of the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory. And over the next 30 minutes, 90 minutes, sorry, we'll be looking at the impact of COVID-19 on family justice and sharing the feedback that we've received about remote hearings in the family court. We'll also be hearing about the challenges of running hearings remotely and about how to address them. To do that, we'll hear from a range of different professionals sharing their insights and practice. And we're going to be joined live by Lord Justice Baker to discuss the recovery phase for the family court in light of the pandemic. But first, here's Sir James Mumby, Chair of the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory, to introduce why we're here today. Welcome to this Nuffield Family Justice Observatory webinar series for the Judicial College. The Nuffield Family Justice Observatory was established by the Nuffield Foundation in 2019 to improve the lives of children and their families by putting data and evidence at the heart of the family justice system. All the people who work within the family justice system, judges, lawyers, social workers, CAFCAS guardians, policymakers, and more, share a common goal, helping children and their families to thrive in the future. But understanding how to achieve that ambition is limited by a lack of readily available data and research evidence, and too few opportunities exist for those involved to share their knowledge and experiences. The observatory exists to find and fill the gaps in our understanding of the family justice system, to highlight the areas where change will have the biggest impact, and to foster collaboration to make that change happen. The centre of its lens is on the family courts, but its focus extends far beyond this. To understand the support that children and families need before they reach family courts, and what happens after they've been through the family justice system. It is entirely independent, working with leading academics, reviewing evidence from around the world, and commissioning new research where it is needed. During the pandemic, it has swiftly turned its lens on the impact of COVID-19 on the family justice system. Hearing from those experiencing the issues firsthand, not just professionals, but also importantly families, and identifying the opportunities and challenges abrupt changes to practice have offered up. Throughout this series, you will hear from a range of experts and others with experience of the family justice system on a range of issues, from the immediate impact of COVID-19 on hearings in the family court, to how best to manage contact between children in care or adopted and their birth families and more. As a family judge, I need no persuasion of the importance of the Judicial College. In my new role with the observatory, I have rapidly come to appreciate not only the importance of research, but also just how valuable it is in illuminating much of this obscure in the work of the family justice system and in enabling us to see how things can be improved. I hope that this webinar series will be the beginning of a long and fruitful collaboration between the college and the observatory. So James Mumby. So today we'll be the evidence on the impact of remote hearing, drawing on the findings of two consultations that the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory ran in the last 12 months, one in April 2020 and one in September. We were delighted to respond to the President of the Family Division's request to run these consultations in order to better understand the impact of remote hearings, both on those coming before the Family Court and those working within it. We heard from parents, judges, magistrates, barristers, solicitors, social workers, and many others. In total, we received over 2,300 individual responses to consultations. And provided, this provided us with a rich picture of the family justice system at this extraordinary time. Here's an overview of some of the key findings. COVID-19 had an immediate and dramatic effect on courts in England and Wales. Audio hearings increased by more than 500% and video hearings by 340%. Pushing forward to achieve remote hearings must not be at the expense of a fair and just process. But has the court process been fair and just? We ran consultations in 2020 
and more than 2,300 parents and professionals from England and Wales shared their experiences. They highlighted both the benefits and challenges of remote or hybrid hearings. In all, 37% of professionals felt fairness and justice had been achieved in the cases they were involved with, and a further 40% said it was achieved most of the time. I think they have been fair and just in terms of legal outcome, but I'm not sure the perception has always been of fairness and justice being done. 88% of parents and family members told us they had concerns about the way their case was dealt with. The judge has never seen me. I'm not allowed to speak, so she can't hear what kind of person I am. There were many technical problems reported and worries about the difficulties of being empathetic and supportive. There's no opportunity to look them in the eye, to convey to them your own humanity, to either encourage or warn, all of which I consider to be a vital part of the initial stages of the care case. The parents sobbing alone in their flat listening to a ruling of not getting baby back was harrowing. There were concerns about particular difficulties for those with a physical or learning disability. Many professionals worried about the impact on the formality and authority of the court. The social worker was zipping in and out. And that wouldn't have happened in a court. They would have had to be sitting there in silence. While some courts had at least partially reopened by the end of last year, most hearings continued to be virtual or hybrid. In order to achieve a fair and just process moving forward, it's vital we learn the lessons of 2020. So let me say a few words about the format of today's event. Over 1,200 individuals have signed up to attend today's webinar. And for this reason, we will not be able to see you during the event, but we do want to hear from you. Please share your experiences and your questions in the Q&A tab. We will pick up some of your questions and comments during the event. We're also going to invite you to give us your feedback on today's event. This will help us shape future webinars. So look out for the link uh, to the feedback form, which will also be in the Q&A tab. We're recording today's event. So if you'd like to revisit any of the presentations, we'll, we'll be able to make those available to you via the Judicial College and our own website in the coming days. Now, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Mary Ryan, who is going to look in more detail at the main areas of concern that were raised during the consultations. Hello, I'm Mary Ryan, and I'm an associate of the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory and I'm one of the authors of the reports of the consultations that we're considering during the course of this session. I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about some of the challenges to ensuring that remote hearings are fair and just. We touched on some of those in the introduction and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail now. You will, of course, be familiar with most of these. We had many responses to the co both consultations from judges and po possibly those of you uh, taking part in this session will have sent in your views. Um, so you'll know that even so, though things had improved by our consultation held in September, there were still challenges. And it was interesting that in both the uh, consultations, the themes that emerged about the challenges, the nature of the challenges were the same. So I'm going to start now looking at the issue of isolation. This is something that was raised by both professionals and families, but it's relating to lay parties and parents joining hearings on their own. This makes it harder for them to feel that they are really part of the hearing. Uh, particularly if they're joining by phone. It also makes it harder for the judge or the magistrates and for any others involved in the hearing to show empathy to the parents, which has been acknowledged as a really important part of family justice hearings. Similarly, there's no one there who can pick up on mounting distress or note that parents are beginning to be distressed by a hearing. 
we've heard examples of things, parents suddenly revealing uh, their distress and hearings having to be stopped as a result of that. There's no one there to provide support during the hearing or at the end of it, and no one to talk through what's happened or why it's happened and ensure understanding. And these quotes give you some indication of that. Linked to the issue of being on your own is communication with your legal representatives. That has proved to be difficult and was an issue that was raised by many people who responded to the consultations. It's not only about communication during the hearing, it's about pre-hearing communication, which is also by phone or by email or by video, and very, very difficult for many lay parties, particularly parents in care proceedings, giving instructions and for their solicitors to receive those and understand the story properly. It also means that it's frequently the case it would seem that parents have never met or spoken to the barrister who may represent them at the hearing. Particularly difficult in circumstances where the representative is appearing for the parent in an early hearing, for example an interim care order, where the child may be taken away from the parent not to have seen your representative or to have had the chance to speak to them in advance is really difficult for parents. It's difficult for representatives to develop a relationship or to identify any particular vulnerabilities that the parents may have. During hearings there are particular challenges for parents giving instructions uh, to their representatives or indeed for litigants in person to communicate with Mackenzie friends or for people to communicate with advocates. Um, really, you need more than one device. For many parents joining by phone, that's very tricky. They have their phone, they don't have anything else. People talked about using sometimes three screens during a hearing to make it easier to run the hearing, to see what's happening, to communicate with clients, and also to look at the documentation. The other problem is that there is a real lack of places where parents can be with their representatives safely during the hearing. That is offered in some parts and we hear some examples of that later on in the day, but it's very variable and patchy, the provision of such spaces. Connected to all of that is understanding how much people understand firstly about what's going to happen on the hearing and then understanding when the hearing is going on. So there is often a lack of clarity about what technology will be used for the hearing and we've heard from parents and from litigants in person that they don't always know what's going to happen on the hearing, how it will work, when they're going to be allowed to speak it's very clear that it's hard for people to follow what's happening when it's, it's not always clear who is speaking or who they are. That's both on video, but particularly on the telephone. And we know that most parents are still joining hearings by telephone, even when those are set up as videos. There are also faults with the technology, which can make it difficult to hear what's going on or to understand what's being said. And there are also difficulties in accessing relevant documents. E-bundles have been particularly problematic in being able to access them in the first place because of not having the relevant hardware, only having a phone, not having a separate tablet, or being able to actually find the relevant place in the documentation that people are referring to. These quotes give some examples of the problems that people have had and in particular the sense that it's harder for people to understand what is happening than in normal hearings when we know it's already quite hard. One of the issues that's really important and connected to all of this is digital poverty. 
which I think is really become very apparent during the course of the pandemic. Although there are a range of video platforms being used for remote hearings, it's the case that the majority of parents are still taking part by telephone. Parents and lay other lay parties lack access to the hardware necessary. They don't actually always have smartphones, let alone tablets or laptops. They lack sufficient data allowance on the hardware that they do have, but so it's hard for them to join by video or teleconferencing. Um, they don't always in their homes have any private space where they can go for a hearing. So we know um, from the first consultation we did examples of people being in their cars or in a garden shed in one case. They also lack the skills to navigate systems like Teams and people described how hard it was to explain how you logged on, how you navigated those at a distance from people who were already nervous and anxious about a hearing. Vulnerability is a particular issue as well. There are, as well as parents generally in care proceedings being vulnerable, there are also the circumstances where people require interpreters, where we have heard um, of many issues about the problems of interpreters being able to hear people, the time it takes for interpreters to speak to their client and then give the interpretation back, and how tiring it is to have to listen to that. Uh, there are also problems when um, professionals and parties are either hearing or visually impaired and the challenges that that poses for remote hearings. And for parents who are learning disabled, there are really particular difficulties, even if they have the support of advocates before and during the hearings. And the sorts of problems that they have are just the same as others, but um, compounded by their disabilities. And these uh, quotes we show here really uh, bring alive those particular issues. A big problem raised uh, by respondents to the consultation, both first and second consultation, was the concern about what happens if an interim care order is made on a newborn baby or a young baby, and the fact that during the pandemic, it has been very hard to ensure that contact can take place. In some local authority areas, they tried very hard to prioritise face-to-face contact between mothers and infants, or they tried to do everything they could to avoid removal through family placements or residential placements. But where that isn't possible, there are too many mothers whose babies are taken away from them at birth or shortly afterwards who haven't seen those children face-to-face four, five, six months, sometimes longer. The impact on them in terms of their emotional uh, state, the impact on the relationship with their babies and the impact on the likely result of the case at the end of the day is enormous in those cases and of great concern to everybody. Litigants in person have difficulty in any event negotiating the system, but of course it's been made worse by the pandemic and remote hearings. Uh, the levels of support available for them have dropped off uh, so that they have less people around to tell them what's going to happen, how to manage the system. Um, and even when support is available, that may be adversely affected by late notice of a change in the uh, time of the hearing or in the technology being used. Um, some respondents felt that remote hearings improved the situation for litigants in person, that the hearings were, were less fraught, better, better managed. Others felt that it was the opposite, that people behaved worse in remote hearings and on the telephone, that there was more bad behaviour, shouting and abuse and being talked over. There are some examples again here in the quotes of the situation facing litigants in person.
underneath all of this is the issue of administration and the shortage of staff to provide support to the judiciary and to magistrates in making sure remote hearings operate effectively. Uh, there was real concern about the problems there are in having to manage your own remote hearings without the necessary technical and IT support. Uh, there's also a lack of agreement about whose responsibility it is to support lay parties, provide them with space, provide them with equipment. There is no one body that has that responsibility. And as a result, there's very varied response across England and Wales with some local authorities helping. Sometimes it's barristers' chambers, sometimes it's the court. But it's varied and it's not consistent across the country. There is a real distinction between the different levels of the judiciary in terms of the support that they receive from um, admin staff and IT and concerns that that's not always recognised. And there were real challenges for magistrates working together as a bench, but also in receiving the necessary equipment to manage remote hearings and the necessary support. The last challenge I want to talk about is the loss of the formality of the court, which was an issue that was raised strongly in the second consultation. And it uh, arises from the informality really sometimes of the setting in which the hearings are taking place so particularly if everybody is in their homes nobody's in the court uh, and the examples were given of uh, from parents perspective parents talked about judges getting up to receive a parcel in the middle of a hearing um, they talked about professional witnesses walking around drinking cups of coffee um, professionals laughing about a technical hitch when they were there feeling incredibly anxious about decisions about their children. But professionals also talked about parents not apparently uh, recognising formality, being driving in their cars while taking part in the hearing, having other people in the room, one parent apparently decorating while the hearing was going on. For parents who are learning disabled advocates talk about their difficulty in really grasping the seriousness of the situation when they're talking on the phone or if, even if it's where, by video, simply not realising how important this process is and what the decisions are that are being made. And for litigants in person um, attending hearings over the phone, sometimes a similar problem in understanding that this, that was a court hearing um, with people sometimes thinking they've just been at a meeting and that the decisions made are ones that could be changed in the future. Thank you, Mary. I'm sure a lot of the challenges that Mary outlined are familiar to you. Don't forget to add your comments and questions to the Q&A tab. We're very keen to hear your own reflections. Now we're going to hear from a selection of people who took part in the consultation who have agreed to share their experience of trying to overcome some of the challenges that Mary has highlighted. Hello, I'm Carol Whiting and I'm Head of Safeguarding in Children's Services in the London Borough of Bromley. We have set up a dedicated area in our main offices in Bromley where we can actually help families participate in remote court hearings. We have made a large conference room safe in terms of COVID-19. There is space available, which is Wi-Fi enabled, where parents and their lawyers can come and sit in a socially distanced fashion in the room. We provide two laptops for each parent, one where they can access the court bundle and the other where they can actually access the court hearing. We make sure that we meet and greet our parents. We take them to the area. Um, we actually make sure they're all set up and ready to go. And then we leave them to have a confidential time to actually participate in the hearing. We are always available at the background to actually help them throughout the hearing. And we are available at the end to actually be there for them and to support and care for them. We believe that support and care for our children and families is essential during this time. And Bromley are very proud to say that we demonstrate care and compassion to our families um, and we want the best for them to achieve the best outcomes for their children. 
I do know that lo other local authorities are helping our parents um, with a contact in terms of making sure that children who are in court proceedings have regular contact with their parents um, and they have contact centres which are still open during the COVID-19 period uh, where they can facilitate some direct contact between children and parents. Because we do recognise that um, during this very difficult time, um, children do need to see their parents and they need, need to be reassured that their parents are okay. My name is Marie Southgate and I'm a lawyer with Peterborough City Council Child Protection Team. My clients were visiting homes where parents were unable to leave their homes to engage um, physically in court hearings and sometimes they also struggled to engage um, in hearings because they didn't understand the technology that was required, for example, to engage in a CVP or a Zoom hearing. Um, so my um, clients would attend the parents' homes using PPE and they would take with them laptops to enable them to sit with the parent and guide them through a hearing. They would also be sensitive to the need for the parents to have some time alone and confidential with their solicitors. And so this would be facilitated both before and after the hearing. The parents are more able, but perhaps due to a risk assessment of the number of people that can attend court, it's not practical for them to attend the court building. Um, the client has made available um, rooms in their offices which have been um, risk assessed for a minimum number of um, persons, normally three, um, so that they can attend the office and meet with their advocate, um, both uh, their legal representative and obviously, um, more importantly, in most of these occasions, intermediaries who can assist the parent face to face during a hearing. Um, the uh, client has also made uh, sure that there is laptops available to be used during the course of those um, meeting rooms so that the parent will have access to the technology to um, dial into um, a hearing. Um, solicitors and um, local chambers have also um, made rooms available. Um, and so again, parents, um, even though they're not able to physically attend a court building at the moment, should still be able to um, see their legal representative in a safe setting on a one-to-one -one basis and indeed an intermediary to ensure the effective communication of um, information during the course of a hearing. Hello, I'm Nigel Orton. I'm a magistrate and I sit in the Greater London Family Panel based at Holborn. We have tried to ensure that uh, people are comfortable in the hearing, that we take it at a slower pace. So we're listing much lighter loads in a day and we're making sure people have breaks. And we're taking into account all the other pressures that they have when they're trying to be in court of Amazon delivering goods, of childcare or other caring responsibilities, of collecting children from nursery or schools when they have no support bubble around them because of isolating. And if we can't get that right in a family court, where can we get it right in society? So we've been very clear on leading in that way of making sure that we don't push matters through just for the sake of getting work done. Our legal advisors often got into the habit of talking to litigants in person the day before, checking how they were going to join the hearing, giving them some advice and tips and giving them some reassurance about how things would happen. And we've reached out outside of the magistracy to uh, our user groups, particularly what we call the Family Justice Board, which is a meeting of all the local authorities um, that are in our particular court's catchment area. In the case of the Holborn uh, Court, that's 12 London boroughs. And we meet twice a year with their heads of children's services and heads of legal. And one example of sharing good practice there was that some of our justices were feeling very uncomfortable that when children were being removed from parents, the parents were perhaps very isolated in um, small accommodation with no moral or practical support or counselling. We raised that with the London boroughs that were present. They all thought it was an excellent point and they all set about that if there were future hearings of that nature, that the social work team or the lawyers working with those clients would make sure there was the right sort of support. We are spending a lot more time trying to ensure uh, the reasons for our decisions are explained, 
that we're not using jargon, that people have ample opportunity save to say what they want to say in court. And, and whilst this may take a bit more time, we think it is a much fairer uh, process and supports the individuals better. We feel that we've learned to be sympathetic and empathetic in this remote hearing, perhaps in a way that's more pronounced than we were doing in the courtroom. And I'm sure we'll be taking that learning back into the courtroom when we're allowed to uh, resume normal service. Hi, my name's Sophie Carter and I manage the Family Drug and Alcohol Court team in Leeds, FDAC for short. A really key part of that is the FDAC judiciary, where there's specially trained FDAC judges who work with the families on a fortnightly basis to not only kind of um, motivate, empower and review the progress that has been made, but also to share really open and realistic expectations around what is needed from them and what is needed to be seen to be able to support children to return home. And we've worked really hard um, with our judiciary to look at the best possible way to be able to get our families linked into their hearings and still feeling like they're able to take part in their conversations. We've also then spent time planning with our judges when is the best time for them to be able to have their hearings as well. This is obviously limited, courts are busy, but we do need to be mindful that there is less confidential safe space for families to be able to have these hearings. There may still be children at home as well. Um, so again, it might not be appropriate to have it at the original times that were planned. And our judges have worked really hard to be flexible around this with our families. Following court hearings or reviews that we have with our families, it's really important that we're able to go through what has been said, what has been shared, what the key messages are, and for them to have the opportunity to reflect and have conversations around that. Um, as a team, we still continue to offer an intense level of support of interventions. This is twice a week. And we will do a mixture of face-to-face -face and virtual and we have to get creative to be able to balance the needs of the families but also the risks around health and well-being we're also really mindful that a lot of families worries around court are discussed in the waiting areas they seek support from their practitioners their social workers their legal during these times and while we're remote they can't do that so it's about really making sure we're making extra time to check in with them before and after the hearing so they've got a really good understanding of the processes and what has been said. Um, it's also been um, about supporting families to have flexibility to be able to dial back in if some of their technology is um, struggling so at least they can still hear the conversations which you know are so crucial to the changes that they want to make. My name is Carrie Winter, I am a practice manager in East Sussex County Council family support team. What we've really noticed um, is a lot of conversations and support happened in the pre-hearing discussions that would have happened in the court before those hearings started. Um, so it's really important that we're having those conversations with parents, explaining to them what the hearing will look like, where the judge will be, you know, when they should speak, um, supporting them to know and understand how to access that um, from the orders that come through. Um, some of the issues we've had as parents joining by phone and not knowing that everybody else is already in there and kind of saying hello what's happening so just explaining what that will be like at the start of the hearing um, and expectations parents are hearing decisions and then potentially if they're not coming into us they're at home on their own sometimes the connection or just the language and conversations that happen after a judgment they're not really clear what's happened and, and what that means um, and judges are getting better actually at, at being clearer so I think that's helpful this is the order this is what's going to happen uh, barristers and solicitors then phoning parents after the hearing and then us having those conversations about what happens next so I think making sure there's more communication um, in the days up to the hearing and before and after that hearing directly with parents I'm Kirsty Mann and I'm an independent advocate and I both own and manage an independent advocacy organisation called Your Say Advocacy. We spent um, about two weeks um, not face-to-face -face working and then made a decision as an organisation that we couldn't do our job unless we're actually with people. So um, right from early days of the first COVID lockdown, we've still continued to work alongside the parents um, to support them to be able to access 
um, court hearings directly. We work face to face, we go to wherever the client is, to their family home, to um, residential assessment units, um, to foster placements. Um, we use our own office space where that's appropriate. We've hired rooms around the country so that we can safely be alongside the person that we support. Um, and primarily our focus then is about ensuring that the person that we're supporting can genuinely access and follow the remote proceedings. What we're having to do now is prepare people for the realities of what a court hearing by video platform looks like. Um, so we spend a lot of time preparing people. We'll do the reminder texts, the reminder emails in the run up to the court hearing ideally be alongside them before the hearing and then support them during the hearing and then a similar process at the end so following up making sure that people have genuinely understood what's happened that if they've got any questions they've got that opportunity to either ask it of us or to ask it of their um, legal team afterwards we undertake an assessment of almost all the parents who are now referred to us through um, through the court and tribunal service. Um, so we'll undertake an assessment which assesses the specific needs of each individual parent in terms of their participation in the court process. So that will look at things like people's level of concentration, whether or not people are going to be able to access the bundle easily, whether or not they need people to read extracts rather than expect them to read it themselves. Um, we look at people's understanding of the use of remote kind of platforms, video platforms, um, and offer the court uh, and the other professionals, you know, therein, um, some information and some advice about how they're going to best support the parent to participate fairly in the process. We've produced a couple of um, reports and reflections of practice that we've shared quite widely, certainly with our, within our sphere, um, of professionals that we work with, so with um, legal teams, solicitors, barristers um, and the courts to share our thoughts on what works and what doesn't work and to offer some um, thoughts and reflections on things that could improve um, the situation for the parent. So I think as we all become very familiar with working in a remote way and with remote hearings and this becomes our new normal, we risk um, losing our parents in that process because what becomes normal to us is still not normal to the parents and courts are really serious and significant event in their lives in the lives of their children and it's incumbent on all of us no matter what our profession is to remember that the parent um, needs to be able to understand the process to follow the process and if this is to be our new normal, then there is still some way to go before we've genuinely created a scenario where I feel that it is completely fair and equal for the parents. That was Kirsty Mann from Your Say Advocacy talking about how this is fast becoming our new normal. So how do we ensure that hearings are accessible and fair? To answer this question, Mary Ryan is going to outline the ideas that respondents to our consultations highlighted when we asked for suggestions for good practice. I'm now going to talk about um, some suggestions for good practice for the future, but I'd like to thank all of uh, the people who have helped us by agreeing to be interviewed to talk about how they are responding to the challenges that we've been talking about today. We are really grateful uh, for their contributions, which I'm sure you will have found very interesting. So, the final chapter of our second report sets out some examples of ways in which things could be improved. These are suggestions made by the people responding to the consultation. Um, 
Some of them will require additional resources and time. Others are really uh, less costly and are more about good practice and time uh, to prepare well for hearings. I'm just going to run through some of these. The, we were very pleased that the president of the family division has basically attached this chapter to his update of the road ahead uh, for the system. So some of the suggestions that were made were around the technological improvements that were needed, uh, particularly for hybrid hearings, such as access to big screens in courts, to headphones, to proper loudspeaking systems that would enable hybrid hearings to work well when we can go back to that method. Uh, there were also suggestions about improving the technology to make it much easier for interpreters and for advocates and other supporters to be part of the hearing and provide support to their clients during the hearing. And we've heard about developments that HMCTS are working on, on the um, cloud video platform system to have a separate um, platform for interpreters, which should make it much easier for those hearings to be um, heard properly. There are also discussions about having separate platforms or breakout rooms for legal representatives uh, so that they can interact with their clients more easily if they're not able to be in the same space with their clients. Other suggestions made were, for example, a virtual usher who can speak to parties waiting to come into the hearing at the start. There was also recognition of the real need for more spaces and places where people can be with their legal representatives or with their advocates or supporters. Uh, so developing those very good examples we've already heard from, from the local authorities who are trying to make space available and the occasional court that is doing the same. There's also very clear messages about the importance of providing some additional support to enable litigants in person to take part more effectively than they can at the moment. Other recommendations include some national guidelines around the face-to-face -face contact for parents who've had infants removed during care proceedings. There does seem to be a real need around that issue to ensure that better attention, more attention is paid to the longer term implications of not allowing face-to-face -face contact. Uh, measures to improve the gravitas of hearings, which could be fairly straightforward. For example, just having a standard court crest in the background and also better court administration so that there aren't uh, too many problems with the setting up and the technology of running remote hearings. Linked to that, obviously, is better IT support, particularly for district judges and for magistrates. Then there's the need for greater clarity about who is responsible for enabling parties to have access to hardware, to ensure good connectivity, to be able to negotiate and navigate the software, uh, to participate in hearings. Who's, whose responsibility is it to provide that level of support for people? And back again to more administrative staff generally to ensure the smooth running of hearings, but particularly the need for staff with the necessary IT skills. Then there are very specific things about improving the way hearings are run. And many of you may think, well, we do this already. But it was very clear from the responses that we received that this wasn't always happening across the country. So, for example, there are things like having sufficient notice of the hearing. Uh, for there to be clarity about the technology that's going to be used and for that not to be changed at the last moment. That the technology is tested first. Avoiding late changes of everything would be really helpful for people who are trying to join remote hearings. Advance information for parents and for lay parties about the process, about the ground rules, how it's going to run, that they would have that in advance and some uh, attempts to ensure beforehand whether there's going to be how the communication between the lay parties and their representatives is going to take place. Making sure there is a bundle for everybody before the hearing and that it's going to be something that people can navigate easily. 
making sure magistrates are going to be able to communicate with each other. Then there are um, very specific suggestions about running hearings, starting hearings, running hearings, um, with some obvious guidance like starting on time, uh, reminding everyone that this is a court hearing, uh, introducing everyone who is joining, whether they're on the phone or on video, starting with a very clear expectation of how the hearing is going to be run so that people will know that they're going to have the opportunity to speak. Checking again that parties are able to communicate with their legal representatives. And then once the hearing is going, making sure that people are provided with the opportunity to speak, take some regular breaks, use the mute button to mute those who aren't speaking. Um, if there are problems of communication between lay clients and their representatives, allowing time for that communication to take place. And then at the end of the hearing, making sure that everyone is very clear what has been decided and what the outcome is. The other proposals that were made were the importance of having something like an advocates meeting before the hearing, um, making sure that there were a range of screens available because it is clear that it's not just one screen that's needed to follow the hearing, but another screen for communication possibly until new platforms are set up and also for reading bundles. So those are the main suggestions for improving the running of remote hearings, which, as I said at the start, many of them are not costly. Uh, they are about practice, about making sure that people have the time and the support that they can run hearings effectively. Uh, technology, of course, investments in technology will also need to happen and increases in the administrative and IT staff supporting courts to deliver remote hearings. We're now going to hear some examples from people around the country, again, about different sorts of technology or ways in which technology is being used or how they're helping to people, helping people to use technology. Before we move on to an open discussion where we hope that you'll be bringing your own good examples of practice from around the country. Thank you very much. CVP seems to be um, convenient because not only can you use it on a, a vast form um, of different um, devices, the iPad, the laptop, the telephone, um, we also find it the most effective um, piece of technology that we have. Um, I think it's been a learning curve for a lot of people, including several judges that I know. <laughs> um, and uh, we have visited the court building um, and our ICT uh, team have been wonderful because they have um, supported um, some members of the judiciary um, to understand technology. The court has helpfully prepared guidance notes for advocates and also for those engaging in virtual hearings. And if we have um, lay representatives um, or parents with particular difficulties, we ensure that we speak to them prior to a hearing to ensure that they understand the process um, of engaging virtually with a hearing. Pre-hearing discussions, which perhaps traditionally would have taken place in court with social workers and guardians engaged in those meetings. Um, we now arrange them um, well in advance of a hearing, probably up to an hour in advance of a hearing, which would just be for the advocates only and then we'd break off, allowing sufficient time for us to speak to our clients, for solicitors, parents to speak to their clients, to update them with regards to discussions, um, and also um, provide them with an opportunity to ask any questions or give updating instructions before a hearing commence. Of course, prior to the pandemic, we were all mindful of moving towards electronic bundles. Um, but again, um, in this process, not everyone has access to two screens. Um, and so it's very difficult for parents and indeed judges and professionals um, to engage in a hearing and also to try and um, look at documents which would normally be available on the same screen. So again, we are liaising with our colleagues and with the judges to see whether or not they would benefit from the provision of paper bundles prior to um, hearings, particularly contested hearings. And if we have a, a witness that's due to um, give evidence at a trial, 
again, we liaise early with them to ensure that they understand the concept of a virtual hearing and have the technology available to facilitate them to give evidence. We'll also discuss with them whether or not they would find it beneficial to have access to a full paper bundle um, uh, rather than just an electronic bundle on the day of the hearing. I think one of the things that's been key to the success of local practices has been a really good dialogue um, with your designated family judge and key professionals um, involved at the forefront of these proceedings. So for example, CAFCAS, um, local heads of chambers and uh, family um, panel solicitors. And we in Peaceborough, we have a, a, a meeting at least once a month to discuss whether or not there's any perceived um, issues following COVID and its practical implications and how we can support one another through this process. We very soon got up and running using the BT Meet Me system, which my colleagues and I found to be a very challenging medium, sitting as a group of two or three magistrates on a group call. Most of us had not had experience of that medium before. But uh, we soon adapted and we realised as the leadership of the panel that we needed to support our members and we needed to look at what was going to be good, consistent practice with high standards and to make sure that the hearings were going ahead in a fair and appropriate way. We've set about trying to uh, make sure we were behaving professionally and making sure that we were properly attired, that they weren't drinking coffee, that we were giving people their f our full attention. And we realised um, after a little while that we were inadvertently not doing that very well. We had magistrates who quite rightly wanted to read the papers in the case, but in so doing, they were then reading across the screen like this, which was very off-putting for the clients. Or they were turning sideways to look at the second device over here and not really giving any eye contact to the clients. Um, and, and we've managed to sort of train people to avoid those sorts of pitfalls. Um, we've tried to make sure everyone was sitting with eye contact uh, and we didn't have devices on desks looking up people's nostrils. Anything that would perhaps detract from the seriousness of what are very important hearings for the people involved in them. We took shots of the courtroom crest and we managed to find ways of lo loading that up onto people's devices. And the vast majority of magistrates now use that as the backdrop. And then immediately when you've got several people on screen on a, in a panel view, you can see at a glance who the three decision makers are. And uh, it's very clear then who, who you're talking to and who's talking to you. We got the people chairing the courts to make sure that they gave proper explanations as to what was the purpose of the hearing, how it was going to be conducted, to reassure people on what would happen if the technology failed, which it frequently does, that we would pause, nothing would be discussed in their absence, we would rejoin them. Um, and that was happening as much to the magistrates or the legal advisors as it was to uh, lawyers or their clients. We found that within our midst, we had uh, a professor of media and communication who started to run some bite-sized training on these very points um, with groups of 20 or 30 magistrates coming in on Zoom to hear how to perform in court, how to make sure we were coming across as serious, showing empathy and giving our best performance in a professional way, in the way that we would want to normally do if we were in the courtroom. Some of the things that really assist, we have a number of judges now who are regularly um, either sitting in court, so it's very obvious that they're the judge, they're sitting with the, in their normal seat with the crest behind them, um, and so you can tell they're the judge, or, or the judges have put in a backdrop which has the, um, the court crest behind them. And even though that's a really simple thing to do, it makes a really significant difference in terms of being able to easily identify on the screen who the decision maker is for the parent. I think it's really important that parents understand who's who and that's really difficult on screen at times. 
in some cases we've been able to provide tablets as well so it can support them to access via things like Skype or Microsoft Teams, whichever platform is being used. Um, we've also then had to work with families to think about can they access Wi-Fi and if not we've been able to support them to come to our offices, they've got a safe space, they can access Wi-Fi, they can use our technology and have some support with that and then they can actually feel like they're really engaging in their court hearings. Generally the feedback around using Zoom, Zoom breakout rooms, the ease of logging on, the ease of setting that up has been something that a lot of our families have shared that they've appreciated and that they've valued. Um, not every um, kind of device um, supports some of the other platforms such as Microsoft Teams which can be a little bit challenging. Our key workers will support parents, whether it's a lawyer hearing, a non-lawyer hearing, um, they will be able to provide, again, like I said, a safe space to be able to work, support with that technology. Um, it doesn't matter the type of hearing, the focus is about us supporting the parent to be able to engage with it and actually access it. Um, and what we found is that the legal firms and solicitors have been really supportive of that as well. They really want their families or their parents they're supporting to have the opportunities to be part of those hearings. So they've always advocated for us to be able to support to do that. We have in East Sussex done a training session which was recorded um, where we went through the practical elements of needing to join a hearing. Uh, we have to use a workaround. We're not able to directly go onto the CVP in East Sussex and I think other local authorities probably have similar issues. Um, so we have to use that through Skype. So there's a really clear set of instructions of how to do that and what that looks like. Um, how to use the Surface Hubs and book out the computers for parents. Um, and then just some top tips because it is very different being online. Um, and just thinking about your lighting, your presentation, uh, the fact that your face is very much at the forefront, which isn't the same when you're sitting in a court hearing facing the judge. So making sure you're really aware of yourself in that sense. Um, so just some top tips around that. Um, and that's available online and that can be sent out to other professionals if they are giving evidence um, and is accessible all of the time. We have um, utilised some additional laptops and tablets within our buildings so that parents can come in um, and use those in our office space. Um, we also have surface hubs in all of our main buildings, uh, which are like large TV screens that we can join um, through our workaround with Skype, uh, which is how we access hearings, uh, we can add that smart hub um, to the hearing and then leave the room so that parents can see what's happening and hear what's happening um, without having to have a laptop or a device. Um, and solicitors are sometimes coming in and sitting with parents um, and they work really well for initial hearings um, just so that they can access that and not have to just be on the phone. Um, we're also looking at some additional webcams to go on those boards because at the moment they give a whole room view uh, which makes it very difficult if we're looking at final evidence or oral evidence for a parent um, because it doesn't it's not close enough for them they're sitting in the distance you can't see kind of some of those nuanced expressions or or hear so clearly um, so that's something that we're actively looking into we've also purchased some smartphones some quite basic cheap smartphones that are able to access the internet um, and at the moment, we're exploring how we can manage providing additional data and Wi-Fi. Um, I think that's something that we've really identified for families um, as well, thinking about children accessing home education and our contact offer, which is virtual. Um, but a lot of families don't have a huge amount of data uh, or Wi-Fi in their home, and that makes it really difficult for them to access any of the hearings or, or other meetings. Um, so we have bought some SIM cards, we have uh, some Wi-Fi dongles that we've used um, and looking at ways that we can support that better. Um, and we're in discussion with a local library around the possibility of loaning devices to parents to use at home um, if they're not able to come to the office so that they do have access to a device um, and internet they will have some data on them. What's been really helpful is that ways and means hearings are now part of our normal process. So we have our initial CMH, IRH, but we also have a separate ways and means which specifically thinks about that case, the evidence that needs to be given, um, the parties involved, parents' needs, uh, and how we best meet that for our final hearing. Um, and those have been really positive with each party coming with ideas, 
um, you know, solicitors offering to come into buildings or go into courts um, and managing that with the court. Judges trying where they can to be in court, which I think is really helpful, because those last final decisions can be hugely significant. And parents, I think, need to sometimes hear those in person. Hearing it across a computer screen is really difficult for them. Um, so the technology is still in use. Uh, parties are often in court with social workers and expert witnesses giving evidence um, virtually but there's a in the courts that where we've done that there's been a big screen so it's not just small laptops so the parent can look up and it, and it's as if that person is in uh, the box giving their evidence and they can see them um, and questions can be asked by their barristers within that hearing they've been really helpful as well in just managing parents anxieties Sometimes there may be a worker um, or a support worker who's able to attend or at least be outside of that hearing so that the parents are not left with such huge decisions at home on their own um, and the impact that that can have. Um, so I think hybrid hearings are definitely a really important way that we can move forward. Whereas the initial hearings um, and the case management hearings work really well online. I think we've got much better at having all of those conversations prior to the hearing, advocates meetings, really bashing that out and um, coming to court with an agreed case management order. We've got now ushers in the court who are joining people, explaining to each person who else they need to join, what they need to do, that when the judge is coming, when we start recording. So I think um, to start with, we were managing them, but it felt a bit more chaotic. I think now there's a, a lot more structure around that. Um, and that's really helpful for parents in understanding um, and understanding and engaging that process. Thank you again to everyone who took part uh, and took the time to speak to us and share their experiences and good practice. So just before we move to Q&A and discuss how practice may evolve in the future, I'm delighted that we have a message from the president of the Family Division Sir Andrew McFarlane. I think it's a sign of a strong organisation that's prepared to hold up a mirror to itself and to do it twice as we have done in fairly short order. But it's only any use if you look what's the mirror's held up very keenly at what the mirror shows. And what it shows, partly, is that as professionals and as judges, We've uh, got used to this way of working and in terms of equipment and the way we work, it's going okay. But the other part of the mirror shows that for some people, particularly those members of the public, parents and others who engaged with the uh, Family Justice Observatory, it was not a good experience and we need to learn from that. And some of the experiences these people had are simply unacceptable and are not part of a fair process. And so we need to address that keenly in each case that comes uh, through the courtroom door. It may be too early to say what the long-term implications are, but we have learned how to work in this way. And I cannot think that we'll ever go back uh, fully to non-remote working for some cases, for some families, for some judges it will be the right and appropriate and most convenient way of working. And I think it will simply become part of our repertoire. Uh, but I strongly suspect that many contested hearings will still need to be conducted, and rightly so, face to face in a courtroom. I'm extremely grateful to each one of you for taking the time to attend this webinar. We can never learn too much about the way remote hearings work and how we can improve our own individual practice. I hope that you have found that the detail of this research is as valuable in your work as I have found it to be in mine. Thank you for all that you do and for attending this event. Sir Andrew McFarlane. I'm now very pleased to introduce Lord Justice Baker who joins us live. Lord Justice Baker is a Court of Appeal judge who is a leading expert in children's law and a former senior family liaison judge. Uh, he has been advised, uh, asked to advise the president on the way forward for the recovery phase of the family court following the pandemic. 
Now we're going to try and address as many comments and questions from the Q&A as we can. So please continue to put your, your reflections and your questions in there. But first, perhaps I could ask you, Lord Justice Baker, we heard there the president reflecting on how some of the new ways of running hearings are likely to endure beyond the pandemic. I wondered what you felt would be the long term impact of the pandemic on the way the family court operates. Well, that's a big question, and um, I think uh, no one could spend the rest of the evening answering that. Um, I think, as the President has said, remote hearings are definitely here to stay, but their use must be uh, carefully managed. I think they're going to become the norm for many of us in case management hearings. But I, like the President, I think it's unlikely they will become the norm in the family justice system for hearings involving assessment of evidence or credibility of witnesses, and also hearings which involve life-changing decisions about children. I think that there's no doubt that remote hearings have increased productivity in some respects, and as we get better at them, they may increase productivity more. We need to be careful I think, not to overlist remote hearings. There's been some issues about that. Um, the, the, if we have too much, too many remote hearings, that eats into a time for case preparation, for lawyers and judges and others, and for judgment writing, incidentally, which is something which gets overlooked quite a lot. And you'll recall the president's guidance on the length of the court day in the uh, revised version of the road ahead he published at the start of this year. I think we need to absorb all the good practice recommended in your research consultation, the reports and endorsed by the president. Um, but I think what today has demonstrated is that we have gone a long way to absorbing that uh, good practice. And uh, I'd like to pay tribute, if I may, to the way that judges and practitioners have absorbed uh, those lessons in their absolute determination to ensure a fair hearing. Um, there's much more that needs to be done, but I think um, we're on. The, we've made a good start in trying to make remote hearings a better experience than they clearly were uh, at the start of the pandemic. I think there's a wider impact um, from the pandemic beyond remote hearings. If I could just mention some of those briefly, I think clearly there's been a greater awareness of the experience of litigants, as we've heard today. I think also there's a greater awareness at all levels, including, I hope, within government, of the need for greater resources and greater thought about the process. And we've got so used to remote hearings and to thinking about ways of improving the experience for litigants in remote hearings that I think some of us may find it a shock to get back into, back into court every day, back into court buildings, and find that in many instances the facilities there are just not good enough. I think there's been an increased recognition of the importance of the reform program um, and uh, the work done by the groups headed by Stephen Cobb, Mr Justice Cobb and Mike Keehan, Mr Justice Keehan in public and private law, private and public law, um, and also the work done in financial remedies uh, by Mr Justice Mostyn, Mick Mostyn and others. I think we all recognise now that we need to get on with that reform program, those reform programmes as quickly as possible. But I think there are two other things on a, on a more on a broader level we need to recognise as likely to be the result of this experience. First of all, as demonstrated today, but on many, many occasions, there's a much greater collaboration amongst all those working in the family justice system. It was there before, but it's now much more obvious, it seems to me. And also, I think a greater awareness of the importance of protecting the well-being of everyone in the system. The litigants, who we've heard a lot about today, but also the practitioners, the judges, the court staff, everybody. So those are just some of the impacts, Lisa, I think. Um, there may be others which I've forgotten, but those are what occur to me. Thank you. Well, let me pick up on some of the, the comments that have been made in the Q&A during the course of this event. It's clear from the comments that are being made that some of the good practice that we've heard about during this event is not... Uh, evident all across the country. Yeah. And there's quite varied practice. 
Um, how do we address that? What role can courts play in that process? And perhaps what role can local Flammy justice boards also play pay in encouraging the kind of good practice we've heard about this evening? Well, clearly, events like this are really important. Um, uh, and events, local events, and the, the, the great strength of the family justice system compared to perhaps other parts of the court uh, service is, is, the, is, the, is the structure, the, uh, the way we work collaboratively, which I've referred to already, the awareness um, uh, across the country of the, of, of the need to do things better. I think we've just got to plug away, Lisa, at um, trying to make sure the message gets across. It, 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 it clearly, um, it, it, there are parts of the country where it's not, and, and no doubt many cases where we fall short still. I don't think we should lose sight of the great difficulties that many judges and many court centres are under for all sorts of reasons. There's a shortage of uh, capacity in a number of respects. We're short of judges in, in certain parts of the country, particularly in London and the South East, worryingly short uh, of judges. In some court centres, we are several judges short. In many cases, we've uh, managed to appoint new judges, but they are still learning their trade. Uh, and we've got other capacity issues, for example, with CAFGAS. Uh, CAFGAS uh, staff, uh, court advisors and guardians are now holding caseloads which are just unacceptably high. So um, it's a there are huge challenges and all we can do is plug away and try to make sure the message gets across. I know there's a willingness there across the country to learn and absorb the good practice. And I'm sure that over the coming months and years that will happen. One of the things that uh, the president pointed out and you also talked about um, in, your, in your first response was the, uh, the, the gap um, between the way that judges and other professionals were viewing remote hearings and the experience of, of parents and parties. That, that was something that was very evident during both of our consultations. Do you think uh, as a result of the pandemic, the work that's been done around re remote hearings, the discussions we're having now, do you think there's going to be a greater willingness to consider the perspective, experience and views of parents uh, as, we, as we go forward? Well, I hope so. Um, I mean, it is, I think, the striking, the most striking thing of, that came out of your research, particularly, well, both, both, but particularly the second follow-up research project, which we were so keen for you to do, as you'll recall, in the summer, um, was the, frankly, um, uh, in some respects, appalling accounts, certainly sad and disturbing accounts of litigants undergoing life-changing decisions about their children in circumstances in which they, the parents, felt totally isolated and in some cases helpless. And I think the points that came out today, which you've drawn out today, which Mary and others have drawn out, um, just underline that. I also think the point about digital poverty is particularly important and often overlooked by those enthusiasts for uh, IT solutions. Um, we can't construct a digital process that works for commercial clients um, and assume it's going to be fair for the thousands of vulnerable people going through the family justice system. But, you know, Lisa, this, this has led me to reflect um, that perhaps this divergence between what lawyers experience and what litigants experience is not confined to the remote process. In fact, I'm sure it's not confined to remote processes. I mean, it's led me to think more about what litigants must feel going through the family justice system in normal times. It seems to me that that divergence which has come to the fore in the way that you've illustrated so graphically um, in your research uh, reports um, based on the consultation, that that applies across the board and we need to think about how we can uh, improve the experience, if that's the right word, but certainly make it a fairer and more humane process for litigants in the family justice system, both remotely those who attend remote hearings and those who come back to court. So there's a there's a quite a profound lesson there, I think, for all of us. I can see in the Q and A uh, chat that's been going on during the event that many people are highlighting 
the particular issues for litigants in person and whether more could be done to simply to, to guide litigants who don't have legal representation through the process, obviously during remote hearings, for, but that's an issue, uh, as you'll be aware, even when hearings are not held remotely. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm sure there's more that can be done. It's particularly acute in, in private law, of course, where uh, since LASBO, legal aid um, has largely disappeared, or in a great many cases. And uh, there's much more There's much more that can be done. I know that the um, work of the private law advisory group under Stephen Cobb, uh, uh, that it, they're, they're, they're thinking about that. Of course, we all hope that, um, that uh, the government will reflect on the experiences of the last few years and particularly the experiences of the last 12 months and look again at legal aid provision, public funding provision in private, in, in private law. But I agree, there are so many lessons to be learned and uh, you have uh, graphically illustrated them today uh, and on earlier occasions. Oh, the president himself has said uh, may, on many occasions that we face uh, a long road ahead, I think is, is how he's put it, not yeah. least because of social distancing restrictions remaining in place for some time, but also because of the backlog in cases. Do you think family courts uh, can recover in a reasonable time period? Well, that is um, what we're all hoping for. I mean, if we just take stock of where we've got to, um, the latest figures I have are that the increase in outstanding cases in public children's law compared to the pre-pandemic level is now about 10%. And it was, of course, as we all know, rising. The number of cases were rising steadily over the last couple of years. But since March last year, we've now had the, the current level is 10% more. It was at one stage closer to 20%, but that has come down in the last few weeks. In private law, it's 17%. So there are 17% more cases in um, the court system, in private laws, than there were in March. And that's a very significant addition to the backlog. But it's not as great as in other uh, jurisdictions, where in, in, in the Crown Court, there's a 40% increase in outstanding cases. And not surprisingly, that's getting the headlines um, in, in, the, in the national media. But there's also a similar backlog in other areas, such as employment tribunals. So our backlog is 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 worrying, concerning, but it's 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 happily, fortunately, not as bad as in other areas of the law. Unfortunately, the average disposal time has increased in public law. Um, of course, the great aim of the uh, reforms introduced following the Family Justice Review were to reduce it from its previous levels, which were, you recall, over, over a year on average, down to 26 weeks. And that was largely achieved um, uh, under Sir James Mumby uh, in the years following the introduction of the, of the various reforms following the Family Justice Review. It's now gone back up on average. The last figure I have is 39 weeks. Um, so it's getting... That's quite alarming. So that's a work it all out. That's a 50 percent increase in the average time, assuming it was 26 weeks and it was creeping up before the pandemic. But it's now gone back up to 39 weeks. So that demonstrates the challenge we have. It's going to take a long time to get back to 26 weeks, bearing in mind, as I say, that demand was increasing before the pandemic. So that illustrates the importance of the reform programs which are under consideration. And it also um, demonstrates the importance of sticking to the uh, messages of the president's road ahead document, tighter case management, focusing on the key issues in the case. But we also need to address the capacity issues that I've uh, highlighted earlier, shortage of judges in some areas, the availability of magistrates, legal advisors, the CAFCAS resource issues, the great pressures on local authorities, children's services, who of course having to grapple with all sorts of issues uh, as a result of the pandemic, as well as the ones we're talking about. And also at national government level, we mustn't lose sight of the pressures on DfE as well. So there's a lot to be done in order to restore us to where we were before the pandemic or ideally in a better position than we were in March last year. But I, I, hope, that, um, I hope that it can be done and there's certainly no lack of enthusiasm and determination amongst everybody to do it. 
Well, I want to ask you about resources because there's been, uh, as you can imagine, in the Q&A, a, a lot of discussion about problems with tech, um, lack of support in terms of uh, support to run hearings. And this was um, a, a very common theme in both consultations. Yeah. Uh, can we reasonably expect more resources to be coming into the family just justice system to deal with those sorts of issues? Well, um, there's certainly a willingness within those that I speak to in, in HMCTS um, to do what they can. We have, we, they have achieved a, a, a not insignificant increase in manpower across the country within the court service. Um, of course, uh, under um, the reforms that were introduced, um, I'm trying not to say austerity, but I've got to say austerity, the austerity led reforms, uh, as you know, justice was not a ring fenced department and the cuts to the justice department over years were very considerable. And we felt that in the court service and that we felt that with the reduction in court buildings, the, cutting, the closing of certain court buildings and the cutting of staff. Now, over the last uh, eight, 10 months, there's been a recognition within HMCTS and MOJ that, that certainly in the short term, we need to reverse a number of those things. That's why we've got courts opening uh, and the commitment to opening the new so-called further Nightingale courts and an, uh, a recruitment program. That takes time, but they are, they are, um, they are a success to recruiting people. It's taking time, but they are doing it. And there's a commitment towards uh, improving tech, tech, tech facilities with, this, with CVP and also an investment in other digitized processes. So I think there is, I mean, this is, a, I, I must avoid political comments, of course, but I think there is a recognition within government that certainly in the short term to meet the problems that we now have, there has to be an increase in resources um, in buildings and people and tech whether it goes far enough, whether it will continue once we get through the lockdown, we'll have to see. Thank you. Um, I want to return to the question of well-being because you mentioned that um, earlier and indeed in response to the consultations, there was a lot of concern uh, about uh, parties and parents involved in proceedings, but also about the impact on judges and magistrates yeah. and lawyers and their own well-being. Um, what can be done to ensure that we can get through these uh, coming months with uh, such huge pressures in terms of uh, applications to court, uh, such difficult working environments, um, without that taking a toll on the well-being of, of those working within the family court? Well, I, I think that um, we, we simply cannot allow that to happen. Um, uh, and uh, I know that the president is absolutely committed to putting uh, at the forefront of what happens, the well-being um, of the, everybody in the system, that's the litigants, but also people working in the system. And I hear stories of, of professional the, the meetings I have, the fortnightly meetings I have with the, the leaders of the professions, the president and I have, and Lucy Tice have with the leaders of the professions across across the country and with the meetings I attend that Lucy and I and the president attend with Kafkas and other agencies, other stakeholders, and all that I hear from other from other judges, both uh, in London, but also what I hear talking to judges across the country, that, that the pressures that the professionals are under is enormous. And uh, I think all of us have, to some extent, felt uh, our well-being has been undermined by this experience. And um, of course, we are we, have, we lawyers have a very bad track record, Lisa, as you will know, of looking after ourselves. Um, and you know, I've been as bad as every, anybody else, as um, my family would tell you about uh, working at all hours, working after midnight as a lawyer many days, several days a week. Um, that's what that's, there's a sort of mac, macho culture, I think, in, in the law, even in family law. And that isn't good for any of us. It's, it's also not good, I think, for the leaders of the profession to uh, expect that of everybody else. And I have come across some cases in which, or stories of um, uh, leading counsel, perhaps, 
having expectations of juniors and solicitors. And I think there's now recognition within um, the professions that simply isn't good enough. And the president, of course, has has been very clear about issuing guidance, uh, about sending emails, about ex expectations um, on on lawyers being uh, being being within proportions. So uh, I think that um, we will just have to keep uh, juggling everything. We'll have to do what we can to uh, tackle the problems, um, bringing the uh, backlog down. But in doing that, we mustn't sacrifice our commitment to the importance of sustaining the well-being, nurturing those who work in the system, uh, because that is, if we if, if if we if we don't do that, then we're not going to be able to deliver uh, to our clients the service they deserve. I'm conscious we're talking about well-being uh, as we're already eating into everybody's evening. We, we're just going to bring the event to a close. But one final question for you, Lord Justice Baker. Um, despite all the challenges that have been faced during the pandemic, uh, one thing has been very striking. The, the family court has continued to operate without uh, a break. Um, uh, actually, everybody has adjusted very quickly to new forms of working. Um, in some ways, the family courts uh, have been uh, perhaps more agile than in other jurisdictions. I wondered why that was, uh, why you thought it has been possible for those within family courts to really cope with such uh, a significant crisis? Well, I think the early decision um, taken at the outset to keep going during the lockdown, despite all the problems, was crucial. Although it involved enormous effort and great sacrifice by everyone involved. Um, I think we all realised that the imperative of looking after the children who were the subject of the proceedings was such the statutory obligation of course to avoid delay was such we simply had to keep going but why why well why would we did the, well why is it more better for us than other perhaps other jurisdictions well i think the structure of the family court helps um you know it's a well-structured system with the president at the top uh and um I think that helped. But I also think the established habit of collaborative working, um, which we've built on in the pandemic, but was definitely there beforehand, has been invaluable. In particular, the relations between judges, lawyers and other professionals at national level between the president and other senior judges and representatives of the legal professions that I've already referred to and other agencies, CAFCAS, local authorities, government. Um, at local level, similar collaboration headed by the DFJs. And then in each individual case, uh, the way the PLO is structured in particular, but also I think to some extent the way the Child Arrangements Programme for all its imperfections works. Um, I think um, that encourages collaborative working in each individual case. Of course, all that works much better in public law where you've got lawyers involved than in private law where often you haven't. So I think I think it's the it's the structure of the system and the practice of collaborative working that have helped us where other courts have perhaps struggled. But I think it's too early to make a definitive judgment, Lisa, about whether we have how we perform relative to others. It's um, it, it's um, uh, it's still not, we're not out of the woods yet. Let's see how it all looks in a year's time. As you say, time will tell. Um, well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you very much to Lord Justice Baker. Thank, Thank you. you to Mary Ryan and to everyone else who um, took part in today's event. If you'd like to download our reports on remote hearings, please go to our website, which is nuffieldfjo.org.uk forward slash remote hearings. You can also sign up for our regular bulletins via our website, and all of these details will come up on your screen very shortly. Um, finally, I'd like to say, uh, please, we'd be very grateful if you could provide some feedback to us on today's event uh, via the link in the Q&A tab. But thank you all very much for attending today's event, and we look forward to welcoming you to future webinars. Mm -hmm.